All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this uh, awesome uh, September 2024 BrainX community session. And we have two very eminent uh, clinician scientists who are leading the work and implementation of AI and healthcare. So very excited to have them. But uh, I see a lot of new faces. So I just want to give a brief overview of uh, BrainX community. Uh, we started this uh, around six years ago. It's been a very successful journey for us. The idea was let's build a platform where we can all uh, intersect, where we can all collaborate together and learn together. So very successful years, grown to a, be a 6,000 plus member international community with multidisciplinary team members from across the world. We have a very link, active LinkedIn group. So if you're not on that, please join us on that because we share a lot of educational materials, scholarly work, conferences, and other information on that. Uh, of course, our website, I'll go through that briefly, is uh, the constant source of content and repository uh, that you can use. And we have these monthly live sessions where you can interact with the eminent speakers, uh, learn from their work, and have an opportunity to interact with them. So uh, we're grateful to our speakers for, for joining us today. So this is our uh, homepage on BrainX Community. If you haven't been there, uh, again, it gives you all the information right on the very first page. We have the Connect segment, which uh, hosts the information and provides you with the links about the future monthly webinar sessions or the links to the video recording on our YouTube channel for the ones that you might have missed. So please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can watch these even if you missed it. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a very active LinkedIn group, so please uh, join us over there. It goes by the name of BrainX Community, and you'll find a whole host of information being shared over there, so stay up to date there. We have the Learn section, which provides you with links to the latest and the greatest publications related to AI and healthcare. It, it can be filtered by the specialty of choice that you are looking for. Uh, again, we, can, we provide the links to these uh, publications and uh, gives you a focused way to look at some of the greatest publications. And then everybody is looking for data, right? You want to get your models built. And one of the key things that we do is to curate the list of open source data sets so that you can go there, you can find the data that you need. Again, these are open source data sets so we require minimal DUA for research purpose uh, for most of them. And then you can start building your models and do your research or validate them against the data that is open source and available to you. Again, you can filter it by the different specialty options. And what's exciting is that the large language model data or foundation model data is also now being shared and made available. So there are links about that. So while generative AI is exciting to everyone, the data is also coming out there. The models are coming out there and becoming more and more open source. Uh, and of course, we have our podcast series where we feature uh, the eminent uh, uh, people from across the world, whether it's with AI uh, background or clinicians uh, who have been working in this or with other backgrounds with AI and healthcare context. It's great to listen to their journeys. It's great to be inspired by them, learn from them, what's the vision, vision for the future. So please subscribe to our podcast uh, series uh, through any of your favorite mediums, whether it's Spotify, Apple, or Google, and you can get that right uh, into your email as soon as that's available. We also provide you with um, uh, information about meetings and conferences. We keep it up to date. So some of the meetings and conferences that you might be looking forward to either present your work at so that we can learn from you, or you want to go to interact with others and learn from others, it's a great opportunity. So you can always visit that. We try to keep it up to date uh, so that you can have that option. And we also provide a whole host of frameworks and tools for assessment for AI and healthcare. You can directly go to our website and it provides you with that. And of course, uh, from that, uh, Frank Pepe and I wrote this book, which is now available uh, on Amazon. Uh, it's about how to get AI implemented in healthcare. It talks about various different aspects of that. So please check it out. But with that, the more uh, impressive thing, getting people from three at least different continents together, myself, Dr. Sandeep Reddy, joining us from uh, Australia, and Dr. Bart Gutz, although he's here in California, he tells me, but he uh, represents the continent of Europe. Uh, excellent guys. You can look at their CVs. I actually don't want to go spend too much time going through their profile. I would rather have them talk about the exciting work they're doing. So with that, I'm actually going to invite Dr. Bart Gitz uh, to come and introduce uh, himself and 
uh, share the information that he wants to share about journalizing and healthcare. So, Park, over to you. Thank you, Piyush, and uh, congratulations on building this society. It's, uh, it's great to be uh, allowed to present some, uh, some work here. So let me share my slides. Uh, so what I want to talk about today is looking at the uniqueness of healthcare institutions. And in all fairness, earlier uh, as a young doctor, I was kind of frustrated that we all thought that we were different and that we, every hospital uh, required a different approach. But the more I get into data science, I actually have come to appreciate it. So I want to dive in to this topic and just show you the work that we've done and I look forward to a, to a discussion on that, uh, at the end. So this is my background and uh, conflicts of interest. I am the shareholder of Health Plus AI and that's part of the work that I will be sharing with you today. Um, we have a diverse team and maybe that's already learning number one. Uh, as a clinician diving in, you can become a data scientist or a data engineer, but you need a whole lot of other people uh, especially when you want to bring it to multiple hospitals. So regulation and all kinds of other things start to, to be really important. So our drive is really to help transition healthcare providers from the more reactive nature of delivering care to a proactive way of delivering care. And we focus specifically on surgery care. So as we currently see it, one in every five patients get an infection. And when I talk about infections here, I mean the full scope. So not only surgical site infections, but also pneumonia, sepsis, uh, any other shape or form of an infection. And then, of course, looking at the total surgical volume that we have in the world is a huge amount of patients, between 60 to 80 million people getting hit by this problem uh, every year. And if you dive just a little bit deeper, and there's not a lot of data, but we keep on seeing this data confirmed in our own data sets when we go through hospital data, is that the average diagnosis of an infection is made on day five or even slightly later. So I would say, or I, our hypothesis really is, that if you are able to diagnose earlier, you probably can reduce the impact of the infection. Um, as currently, infections double uh, hospital stay, they um, triple uh, recovery time, um, so the cost is very significant. So what we've done, uh, and of course I'll di dive in much deeper, what we've done, we've built a CE certified AI system that reuses existing electronic health record data to predict the individual risk of an infection for each patient. Um, so we only wanted to use existing data, working off what comes out of the electronic health record, I think any innovation requiring more work, the barrier on the value that they will deliver, need to deliver to be used is higher. Um, we also trained it towards safety, uh, and I'll dive into to those specs uh, in, in the next couple of slides. And also one of the frustrations, at least for me and a number of other people is that there is a, there is a dis dyssynchrony between the way an electronic health record shows data to you as a clinician and the way you actually review a patient. So this is in a way not AI, this is just simple BI, but how can we bring all that data together, also visualize it as most brains are not looking, like to look at tables. Um, so can we reduce the number of clicks and really basically go from problem to problem? So. Um, and ultimately, of course, the aim is to reduce admin load, especially with the last part, um, reduce the time to diagnosis, and through that, ultimately uh, deliver um, more affordable care. So this is partly what it looks like. It's a very generic way of uh, showing uh, our, our primary dashboard um, because we adapt to the electronic health record that we're dealing with. Um, so we do a seven-day prediction uh, here on the upper left side, you can see it, and a 30-day prediction, basically trying to align it with 90% of people will be out of the hospital within seven days. Uh, and then for the whole risk period, for almost all surgeries, we look at the 30-day risk. And in an attempt to also deliver some insight and bridge between the current knowledge base and the AI, we deliver also an insight in the risk factors that either increase that, the odds or lower the odds in the prediction. And then the part where I, what I talked about, the, uh, the BI part, what we try to do here is really bring everything that you would want to look at uh, when reviewing a patient for an infection, 
and then going on to the next problem that you want to assess, bring that all together and also visualize it. So temperature, uh, leukocytes, all those kinds of things and bring that together. Um, little thing, we also found that um, we, we do every culture that we need to do two times over or more. So we do a lot of duplicate work. So we also try to kind of uh, prevent that. Again, not AI, but uh, easy means to, to get there. So we chose a particular approach. Uh, as you might know, the CE certification under the new regulation is pretty tough. Uh, I think we delivered ultimately for this pretty straightforward AI solution, 11,000 pages of filing, um, looking at bias and all kinds of other things. But what we really try to do is separate the ETL part of our solution from the medical device. Ultimately, we really hope that there will be an entity that um, provides this middleware to all kinds of toolings because that will greatly reduce the implementation time in any hospital. But we're looking here really at a layer where what we call the engine that you can download as a hospital and simply connect. And then we put the medical device into that cradle if you want. Uh, and then the different functions like storage are, are uh, in that uh, part of the device. So what data do we use? Uh, we look at um, kind of the obvious suspects, I would even say. Uh, so procedures, um, also the length of the procedure, um, uh, uh, patient data, um, and all kinds of other things that are basically, well, basically collected in a standard fashion in, in any center. And I mentioned we are predicting all kinds of infections. Um, and I think one of the challenges in AI really is what is the gold standard? What are what is the label, or what is the definition of the outcome that we're predicting or diagnosing here? Um, so it's quite easy to say infections, and you go to the CDC guideline, and it just states if a physician says it's an infection, it's an infection. If you kind of summarize it, and that's hard to find. So we first found that seventy percent of complications, on average, are not registered properly. Uh, which probably has to do with the process and how we get to them. Um, as in, we discharge a patient, they get readmitted, but we don't redo the registration. Uh, so what we've done is we looked at, are they registered? But we added two layers of to the definition uh, where we started looking at uh, treatment behavior. So if a physician uh, has prescribed non-prophylactic antibiotics and other teams had the opportunity over more than 48 hours to review that, um, um, those uh, treatments, um, then there is consensus that there is an infection. Uh, and otherwise, we're looking at codes for people that got uh, repeated surgery and looked at what kind of surgery they had. So that was really a way of, in a way, pragmatically looking at, at, um, at, at finding those infections. So we also did a meta-analysis, um, looking at, OK, what is out there? And ultimately, the gold standard is, of course, the intuition of the physician, the assessment of the physician, the gut feeling, looking at, will this patient uh, get an infection, yes or no? Looking at biomarkers and their predictive ability, so like CRP or pro procalcitonin, it doesn't really work in taking a baseline measurement and seeing whether you can predict an infection to happen or not. And the same goes for um, NISQIP or other uh, more statistical models where you add four or five um, uh, parameters and then look for the odds of an infection happening. It's about the same kind of uh, accuracy that you get. And then when you look at physicians and how accurate they are, um, there's not a lot of data out there. So we only found three trials and two of them actually had three physicians or less doing the predictions. So not a lot, not big, not a big sample size. Um, yeah, so we went about and we uh, performed a, uh, a validation of our approach. And we first wanted to look at, okay, can we build a single model to serve all hospitals? And I think that has been the approach for most uh, manufacturers in its broadest sense. Uh, but we also wanted to see whether we could find ways to make it more accurate. Uh, so um, one, there's a lack of external validation on the back of that. Um, so these th two things we wanted to address in this study, if you want. So we went about to uh, uh, with three hospitals, Leiden University Medical Center, uh, Radboud uh, University Medical Center, so two Dutch academic hospitals, and then a major 
Belgian hospital um, as well. And um, you can see here that the training data sets were around 50 to 70,000 patients. And then we had a test set of about 10,000 um, or more for each of them. Um, the incidence also varied um, from uh, eight and a half for the uh, seven days to 14.8. To and this seems high for some people, but again, this is really all the types of infections stacked together. So this is surgical site, pneumonia, uh, and other infections all together. And you can see that there's, uh, especially in hospital C, that the incidence is actually pretty low at 4.4. So there's a, there's a nice spread in terms of, of incidence here. Just quickly for those who, who like it, um, as far as that says anything, but here are the SHAP values of, of the model that we created, uh, at least the first one for hospital A. And um, yeah, uh, it is also nice, and I don't think it shows here, to see that when you look at prophylactic antibiotic use, if it's within the window that you need to give it or advise to give it, so an hour to half an hour before the surgery, we actually see that it reduces the risk of infection. But when you go out of that window, um, you actually see that it increases risk. So that's pretty interesting to see kind of the theoretical side coming back into real life. Yeah, so I think this is kind of the core uh, of what we did. Um, so if we take the model from hospital A and we bring it to hospital B, you can see that just looking at ROC, but this goes actually for negative predictive value and all the other metrics, um, that it, it's, it tends to be slightly lower or kind of on par. Uh, but if you actually take a recalibration approach, so you take the same model, but you readjust the weighting of your actually boosting uh, model here, you can actually get a um, optimal performance compared to just using one model from one hospital. So if you take the same model from one hospital to the other, it in general suffers in terms of ROC and other performance metrics. But when you actually adapt it to local practice um, and redo the weights, uh, it actually um, uh, does better. And this is actually something that we also, and this is kind of out of side of the scope, maybe of what I'm presenting here, we also put those models to use prospectively. And we see that they only suffer one or 2%, but in general, the performance keeps on being high. Um, so here, I think it's kind of a first step in saying that a recalibration approach in terms of clinical gains that you can get in getting a better performance have merit um, and, and should be considered. Um, and I think Mayo Clinics and a number of other Parties have already stated that this is kind of the way forward, um, but yeah, this is what we uh, what we found. Looking at um, uh, the uh, calibration curve, um, I think we are pretty satisfied with that, what that looks like. So, if a patient has twenty percent risk predicted, twenty percent of those patients will actually get an infection, uh, and that you see um, not only here but also in hospital B and also for hospital C. So discriminative performance uh, did improve in that approach. Um, and, and we think that local evaluation at least is merit has, has great merit. So before you put something live, you should uh, probably look at doing a um, underwater test before you put a model live, um, even though you've proven it tons of times before. Um, and the other part is that the recalibration approach actually can lead to higher performance and therefore can be considered should be considered. And I think we've seen the issues if you do not validate externally um, and prospectively uh, with the epic sepsis model. I don't know what the state of that currently is, but um, I think there have been some some challenges there. Um, and just to dive in, uh, some limitations uh, in our study. Um, we have a pretty broad definition of an infection, and that can be challenged uh, for sure. Um, we also uh, were working with a data set from Europe or multiple data sets from Europe. So ethnicity and social background were not condensed into the data sets. Um, and also some uh, factors that you would want to take in, some features you would want to take in were not properly um, uh, documented. So I'm afraid smoking is one of the greater 
uh, features to add, I'm, I'm, I think, but it, the, 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 the reliability of that is really low currently in data. Um, yeah, um, I think that's, that's the most important part. What I did, did not mention yet is that we trained the model to have a high negative predictive value. Um, and we found that that actually does really well uh, in this recalibration approach. So we're now getting to see, especially in hospital C, that, that was the latest one we added, that we have a negative predictive value of 99.89%. And that's really looking at, can we safely discharge? And that's also very relevant, of course, if you want to consider um, the 15% readmission rate that we have in Europe and the 22% readmission rate we have in the US after, after surgery. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll was clear in my in what I presented, but look forward to uh, to your uh, to your questions. Yeah, thank you, Bart. Uh, that was awesome, and uh, uh, we'll take questions for you collectively at the end. Uh, right. I did post a lot of uh, uh, comments and or questions in the chat, so you might want to look at those too. It's a very challenging topic because I feel the definition itself is challenging, right? As you mentioned, yes. that's so true that. It, the, yeah. There is no quantifiable definition that is validated, verified out there yet that is agreed upon by by all uh, key stakeholders. Yeah. Uh, uh, even for like when you think about sepsis definitions, they have gone through many iterative changes, and it's still it, it still lacks the the quantifiable approach to that. And so the metrics are, are challenging, like the the altered mental status or change in condition like how do you quantify some of those it's not clear so i think it's a very challenging uh, uh topic to get in I, I give you a lot of credit to, to I, I remember uh you know a few years ago when mm. you were starting this journey and how you have approached it a lot of credit to you and your team to to, to persevere to constantly work on it to, to get to the state which is very very exciting so well, with that, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Sandeep Reddy, uh, to, who's joining us from Australia. A brief intro, Sandeep. Uh, of course, we all know you, uh, and and then look for looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Piyush, and uh, wonderful presentation, Bart. Let me share my screen. So. Um, I think I guess uh, more than myself, I want to focus on the topic itself, translational AI in healthcare, but briefly, I'm the chair of the Center for Advancement of uh, Translation AI in Medicine, which is based in the US. But I've also been fortunate to have Piyush and Bart um, on the board. They're both founding board members along with a couple of others. So what I want to do today in the brief time that's been allocated is to introduce you to the concept of translational AI and why it's so important in terms of implementation of AI in healthcare. Now, if I ask you, what is the biggest challenge in uh, AI application in healthcare? Um, you will obviously have your own perspectives. Um, because of the interest of time, um, I won't invite you to provide your responses, but a lot of responses might come in terms of ethical challenges uh, to do with the infrastructure challenges, to do with data set challenges. My perspective is it's really the very limited adoption of AI in um, the clinical environment, in real-time clinical environment, in healthcare settings. Make no mistake, there are hundreds of AI applications um, and the investment in AI in healthcare continues to increase every year. And um, that's very, very promising. But when you look at the uh, AI application, let's take uh, the biggest uh, market where AI and healthcare applications are in the US in the North American market. While it's very hard to get uh, definitive uh, information as to the adoption of AI in healthcare, whatever limited resources we get doesn't show very promising data. For example, in this data that has been collected from uh, SageCode partners and Harris Poll, it shows that at the best, only 20% of US hospitals have adopted AI in healthcare application. This is after decades of AI in healthcare applications being introduced into the market. And in, uh, with FDA approvals, uh, having over 900 AI applications being available in the market. At the best, we have 20, and conservatively, we have 7% uh, 
And then if you look at another source of information, it says that only 6% of the hospitals have actually 10 or more use cases of AI in healthcare applications. I suspect a proper study would indicate a much more conservative figure, but we don't know that yet. And now if we look at uh, where uh, other parts of the world here in Australia, a peer review study identified that apart from a couple of radiology AI applications, medically imaging AI applications, there were hardly any other AI applications being used in the hospitals. And another esteemed source of information, the Pew Research, identified that a lot of patients are skeptical about the use of AI and they're not very confident that AI can make a benefit out of use of AI. Albeit it's quite dated information, it's from 2022, but still it's an important source of information. Now, even after adoption of AI in hospitals and clinic environments, I, I, issues have been identified. For example, there was a study that identified that the Epic Sepsis AI model really missed about 67% of uh, septic patients. There were other issues that came about which were identified in the study. Google did an evaluation of their diabetic retinopathy um, detection AI application in Thailand and found a lot of issues there too. Um, fair credit to them that they did the evaluation and published the results. And there's also that study under, undertaken by Stanford University where they evaluated uh, AI applications that were identifying skin lesions and they found a lot of variability based on the color of the skin. A while ago in 2019, a Harvard Business Review article identified or proposed that adoption of AI in healthcare will be slow and difficult. Now, if make no mistake, I'm not uh, arguing against the adoption of AI. I'm, as Piyush and Bart know, I'm very much pro AI utilization. I myself am an entrepreneur and AI and healthcare researcher uh, advocating for the use of AI. In fact, a recent uh, Newsweek uh, article, cover article identified that generative AI may be the antidote or the panacea for uh, physician burnout and uh, healthcare uh, professional workload um, alleviation. Now, based on that, we need to really figure out what issues are limiting the adoption of AI. A systematic review conducted in 2023 last year identified ethical, technological, liability, workforce, and social and patient safety issues. Um, another study identified lack of clinician trust and data privacy concerns health and equity concerns and underdeveloped and abs or absent uh, government regulation. The Howard Business Review uh, article, which I referred to earlier, identified two main key, uh, key issues, achieving regulatory approval and the um, issue with uh, deep learning, which is the black box issue where this lack of explainability of to how the decision was arrived at. We don't have the time to go through all those issues, but I wanted to focus on two really big issues, that's the regulatory approval end of things and the external validation. Now, depending upon the country where you want to introduce your AI application commercially um, and market your AI product, you have to go through a regulatory process. So each country obviously has their own acts and regulatory processes. So um, some countries have mutual um, recognition, but generally you do need to go through those processes to be able to market your AI product in that particular market. Now, I don't, we don't have the time to go through all those regulatory process. I just want to focus on the Food and Drug Administration relevant to the US market. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it's not the uh, lack of AI applications. There are quite a few AI applications that are already available, but when you dig deeper, um, it does take a lot of time to get regulatory approval. Um, if you already have an AI application which is similar to the other AI applications in the market, it's uh, generally a shorter process because you're basically not introducing novel features, so it becomes easier to review. But if you want to introduce new and uh, novel features, it takes a long period of time. And here's the kicker. Further to the time that it takes, it's also the fees that's involved depending upon the pathway that you adopt. It can go to hundreds of thousands of dollars. This may be small change for uh, big tech companies or big uh, vendors, but if you're talking about 
startups and small to medium enterprises that can be quite prohibitive. So it's really very challenging from a regulatory process, both in terms of the time it takes, but also in terms of the uh, price and the fees uh, in order to release a production to the market. Now, if you assume once we get the FDA approval, it's all done and dusted. In fact, a lot of studies and a lot of commentators have identified post uh, clearance issues with FDA approved applications. So one of the issues that uh, clinicians uh, in terms of how they perceive AI product is that they seek external validation for those who are involved in machine learning or AI product development, understand external validation is something that is often sought for from uh, clinicians and hospitals, but it's a very hard thing to achieve. From a medical clinical perspective, uh, clinicians uh, seek randomized control trials or prospective studies as the gold standard for validation of uh, any therapeutic good. But are RCGs the uh, answer we're seeking for? Are they perfect? Not at all. They're very time consuming and very expensive. Um, by the time you complete the studies, the results are released, the AI application may have become outdated. And there's also the difficulty in blinding participants because you ethically can't but not uh, reveal to the participant that you're using an AI. That also sort of um, uh, spills into trying to design appropriate control groups, but also RCD, RCDs because they're conducted in a very controlled environment, they may not really reflect the real world, uh, 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 real world settings. And there's also been studies that have identified where RCDs have been conducted. There's a lot of variability in the protocols, but also in how the results are disseminated. So RCDs are definitely not what we are seeking as the uh, perfect solution in terms of external validation. And hence, um, I have uh, decided to focus uh, the rest of my research career and to the Institute uh, to focus on translational AI. So what is translational AI? This is my working definition. It's really the process of moving AI technologies from research to practical clinical applications. So the goal is to bridge the gap between AI uh, research and innovations and ensure that they are implemented in the real, real, world, real world settings and the clinical settings to enhance patient care, streamline workflows and improve decision making in healthcare settings. And if you want to know more about it, uh, please await our publication, which is co-authored by Piyush and myself, which is going to be released later in the year or early next year. With that, I conclude my presentation and we'll Take some questions. Yeah, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, that I, I think you touched upon such important aspects about uh, implementation, which we are all challenged with. And uh, uh, that was very, very valuable and very concisely and precisely curated information. So that would, I'm sure, will be very helpful to to many of the participants and uh, later on who see this recording on. So uh, I'm going to actually start with uh, one of the questions that uh, that one of the participants has, uh, Amandeep Singh, and his question is, uh, in the coming years, uh, how do you envision uh, translational AI uh, in shaping areas like chronic disease management? I, I think that's probably hitting the, the nail on, the, on its head, because what we've seen are these narrow spectrum AIs which are geared towards sick care, what I call sick care, you know, when you're getting hospitalized. But when you think about the timeline of a human being, those episodes are very small and, and uh, they are primarily related to, you know, some interaction with the hospital. The real value, and if I'm understanding Amandeep right over here, is in providing healthcare to prevent sick care uh, or to manage healthcare better. So where do you see that? I think it's a fabulous question. Where do you see efforts related to that? You, you showed, Sandeep, the data that majority of that is imaging because there was a convolutional neural network which was very well uh, you know, utilized. Uh, people felt comfortable using it. So they used it for pneumonia, for stroke, for every second uh, thing. Where do you see the chronic disease management and the opportunities going? 
Well, uh, the World Health Organization has identified chronic disease uh, burden as the biggest challenge healthcare services face. Uh, in material of whether it's AI or any technology, health services definitely have a huge challenge in addressing chronic disease. And chronic disease as an umbrella includes hundreds of conditions, right? We know from definition, anything that any medical condition that lasts longer than three months is a chronic condition and it includes cancer, mental health, apart from diabetes and hypertension. So from that perspective, I think AI is very promising. If you are able to utilize AI from a preventative perspective, as right as you rightly pointed out, Piyush, being able to modify risk-taking behavior, that from a way it's an upstream investment and downstream you have less chances of developing diabetes of those conditions or if you already have chronic conditions, the chances of developing um, complications is less so. I think AI has a huge role and uh, from a translational perspective, I, I'm, it's much more promising um, AI because we're talking about triaging, screening, um, which is, from a, a regulatory perspective, also from a validation perspective, it is less onerous because we are talking about less risky applications as opposed to ones which uh, have semi-autonomous function, which uh, requires much more regulatory approach. So I'm very, I'm very, very optimistic that AI would play a huge role from a preventative perspective, but downstream from a clinical decision support system for, for surgical interventions or of those high-risk interventions, it's still those uh, issues that I raised in the presentation where it might be a challenging situation for vendors and developers. Do, do you think the issue is the lack of data there? Because EHR data nowadays is more readily available to curate sick care, but when you think about like chronic disease management, uh, you know, that data is not necessarily readily available. Again, uh, if you think about some of the mobile devices that have that has started uh, coming into the market, it's getting more and more readily available, uh, but it needs to, to get integrated into some kind of uh, data, universal database where it can be curated instead of just having like individual data on, uh, with yourself. So is it is it primarily a lack of data issue? Because the models I believe are already there. You can use a bunch of different models. I don't think it's necessarily a model issue. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is that the biggest issue right now going there? Yeah, I was really surprised when I went to a presentation where they, um, it was somebody from Google, they said that the highest amount of data that is available in the world comes from the health industry. But when you look at the previous models, you would require, uh, from a supervised learning point of view, uh, label data, data with features that were required. But I suppose with the advent of uh, transformers and with large language models, that requirement of uh, having structured data, label data is less so. But I agree with you, Piyush, um, the quality of data and the source of the data, the ontology databases uh, is still a challenge and also access to data. A lot of vendors and startups find it incredibly challenging to be able to access uh, data from hospitals um, in a way, rightly so, hospitals and healthcare services are uh, worried about confidentiality, privacy, and other acts that apply uh, that may come into play. Uh, we recently had an issue here in Australia where it was identified that uh, patient permission wasn't sought uh, when a, a radiology network shared the data. So my, from my perspective, um, from a model point of view, it's um, the structure and the label data is becoming less important, but access is still an issue because um, rightly so health services are uh, worried about sharing data for commercial purposes. That's great. Bart, want to get uh, your opinion on this, especially where you are uh, working. Uh, so yes, a lot of that, uh, your, your work is around uh, sepsis post-surgery. Hmm. What about the, the, the data that is there pre-operative? I think you, you mentioned some of the efforts to try to get uh, yeah. the social determinants of health data in there, uh, yeah. but powering it up with pre-op optimization data to get into the model or I I guess quite a few patients get discharged 
Mm-hmm. And then they come in, as you showed in readmission data. How, how do you think that impacts it? Yeah, valid question. I think so. We are at the start. We actually started looking at prevention more than care, if you want. So sick care, uh, less so. But we found that it's ultimately you need financial incentives to be there, uh, and this is uh, in a way very cynical. But if there's no reward for prevention or managing chronic disease at the patient level, then that becomes really hard. Um, so th- that was kind of reflecting on what was previously said. Ultimately, that needs to be there. And then another part is, of course, um, the it often goes down. And I, that's why I think LLMs might be much more interactive and therefore um, enticing and changing behavior because you have a companion. But otherwise, changing behaviors, and that's what it's mostly about, or compliance to medication with 80% of meds not being taken, period, or not being taken as should, um, those kinds of challenges are pretty hard to tackle. Um, So yeah, I do want to hope that LLMs can solve that, um, at least to some extent. But yeah, changing behavior is hard. But going back to your question, Piyush, sorry. so we're working on on actually uh, pre-admission or um, uh, pre-operative predictions, which of course is harder in uh, just working off EHR data. Um, so there is a, there is a bigger challenge in getting an accurate model, especially since the impact is potentially even bigger. You might actually choose not to do a surgery or do a different surgery or actually decide to prehabilitate, and especially if someone has cancer that means that you delay the surgery. So we really wanna be sure that we're doing the right thing here. Uh, so that that makes it more challenging. But I think in nine months, we'll have a CE certified uh, uh, model out there. Um, but um, yeah, I think adding wearable data, and we've actually experimented with that. Incre- so post-op for sure will increase the accuracy. We've seen that. Um, it, it really goes up. Just having heart rate variability in there really helps. Um, And my hypothesis is that if we would have that data, any data from Fitbit to whatever non-medical device people would be using, that that actually would be useful leading up to that surgery. And the reason that I'm still hopeful about that us, that we can actually help in being preventative is that the likelihood that a positive lifestyle change put in for a surgery um, uh, that's an increase that you see that it sticks. So it's the best moment to catch people at a life event and, and make something really preventative. Um, but anyway, that's more hope and vision than, than, than a concrete solution right now. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And uh, I, I, when you say mobile data, that's like uh, the, within the hospital monitoring using mobile devices, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that also needs to grow because a lot of hospitals are still not not doing continuous monitoring on the patients, and and that's a challenge too. Because well, one of the challenges with the EHR data is uh, the time that people are entering that data, and if you want to make like hourly predictions or predictions in a few hours, but your yeah. data entry is is variable, then how do you uh, assess for that? That also leads me to this question that you know when we think about generalizing some of these AI tools in healthcare. There is a great divide also, unfortunately. So it's those uh, places where they have the means uh, and they have implemented EHR data. But if you think about, uh, you know, half or if I'm not mistaken, more than half of the population in the world does not have uh, EHR data. And uh, of course, the solution to that might differ from from place to place, but it does impact generalizing these solutions, right? So any thoughts on how do we make some of these solutions that we are building available to all all of our patients? Uh, again, it's a very large question and it's a very difficult task. And uh, maybe it needs to be broken down to individualized uh, locations. But since you represent two different continents, uh, any mm-hmm. thoughts on the lessons learned and what you would, would share? Uh, Sandeep, if you want to go first. <laughs> Yeah, from a health informatics point of view, obviously, uh, EHR and ontology uh, databases, uh, structured data sets is so critical for uh, MLOps perspective. Um, ideally, you would like to have 
um, that kind of setup. Um, but I know a lot of hospitals here in Australia, I suppose some hospitals in the US are still utilizing paper-based records. Um, I do think like it depends upon the situation, Piyush. Um, if you are looking at clinical decision support systems, as you um, pointed out, something that has to be real time, um, electronic health records would be a must. But if you're talking about um, other types of AI applications in the primary case settings or in the community settings, um, the requirement for electronic health records is less so. Uh, for example, Bart was talking about um, streaming data from variable devices and other kind of uh, sources. There, the electronic health records is, uh, requirement is less so, but from a, I don't know, we, we can't speculate what's going to happen into the future in terms of ML ops. Um, but if you look at an ideal setup, um, the integration of AI applications. The other thing that we didn't cover, Piyush, is it's not just enough to have an electronic health record. The application, AI application itself, has to be integrated or built into the HR. Um, otherwise, having a shadow IT, a a uh, second application just adds to the burden of the clinician um, being able to access another application on the desktop, trying to while uh, looking through the EHR, it all becomes very messy. So that's something that is also a challenge that a lot of uh, uh, integration specialists and uh, when you're looking at trying to incorporate AI within the uh, radiology information system or the hospital information system. Uh, Bart, uh, how about the European perspective? Like, what what trends are you seeing over there? Yes, so we have new legislation coming out. I mean, we're in Europe, so we're really good at that. Uh, there's the uh, European Health Data Space, uh, which basically, in short, defines if I break my leg skiing somewhere in the Alps, um, my records, plural, so basically any provider that has taken care of me, should automatically send my dossier to said physician at the bottom of the slopes. So in 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 half an hour, or I, I don't know the exact number, but it's in the order of half an hour to hours. I think we the legislation is really nice, and it it is one step closer to actually bringing the data to the patient rather than keeping it at the institution. Uh, so there there is kind of the the, the data center. Uh, of the of our universe is, is is slightly off and that allows for all these problems to exist um but i don't think that institutions in europe has have already seen the potential impact it has it means that you need to agree on what language you would use what data models you use um and there might be consensus at on on the on the on the on the on the service so you might say yes well let's use fire hl7 but that doesn't mean anything yet if you not dive in deeper and really go down to the nitty gritty. And getting, I don't know how many people are in Europe, 300, 400 million, getting all of that, all of those people to agree on, on something, uh, I'm afraid it will take some time. But I think in terms of legislation, we've put in the right step, which also means that just like in the US, you need APIs to be open and exist and be available to everyone, um, which is really... Uh, unlocking that data from their silos, I think that is a major step. But before we will see effect of that, it will take another decade. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, no. I think that's that's great. I think some of the regulation that Sandeep touched upon and then that we were touching upon, I think will will probably change the momentum of uh, some of these uh, these solutions too. But I want to touch on the last few minutes. Uh, one very important aspect of translation. Uh, I think Bart, you are in thick of it, and and you know Sandeep has already worked on this quite a bit, which is the the human uh, centered design and adoption part of it. So, yes, you can make the best AI tools, and some of the re recent research uh, has shown the evidence that even if the prediction model is great, uh, just like we saw with hypotension prediction index in the pilot study that was done at actually Cleveland Clinic, and uh, also the sepsis model, the TRUES one. Many times there is lack of adoption of uh, of the the delivered uh, response, uh, and how how do we overcome that part? Is this just simple change management? Like how are you approaching it, Bart? As you 
look to deliver periscope to different hospitals uh, right. what challenges do you face and how, how do you how are you trying to overcome that to get it implemented well i think ultimately it all comes down to trust trust and ease of use so i think the interface and and how you can actually turn that insight into an action are more than 50 percent. the model is not even half of it yeah. uh, so um um, we do a lot of research. We just speak to end users. Every three months, we do a big uh, survey. Uh, we do interviews. Um, but we're kind of in a hard place because um, we, we're we we're sticking with the design of the electronic health record. We need to integrate. Um, so we wanted to do things like track users, look at where the mouse, where the pointer is going, how are they using? Because that is really the data that works. I mean, it's been a pre proven model in A-B testing for many uh, big tech companies. It is just something that the technology doesn't allow. Uh, so it's, we're tracking usage, but it's only looking at how long did you open a dashboard uh, and, we're, and we're using that. But again, it's all about trust as well. So other than just sheer design, um, for the design part, by the way, is, is really, okay, we're also gonna save you a couple of clicks. We actually align with the way you think rather than just presenting data where the source or where the source of the data was. So hopefully that is enough to get people in to at least save time, have a benefit there and use the prediction because they're in that window already. That That is kind of the hook if you want. Um, and, and it is about, speaking the language, I think. It's getting as close as possible to the person taking care of the patient. So it is about publication, but it's also about the recalibration. We can tell you at your hospital, in your specialty, what the accuracy is for your patients. We we actually track that, we report that, we actually report the impact and what you're doing with it. And, we go, and you can go even deeper than that. So you can actually... The training is also tailored to that. So we actually tell them the results for their specialty, et cetera. So I think that is our approach. Uh, I will tell you in a couple of years whether that's successful, but I think it's, it should be the, the focus. How do you get end users to see the benefit and actually put that, put that change in? So the last thing I will mention about this is that we uh, actually work with every department in defining what the next step should be. So we're not going to advise you, we probably could, but we're not doing that. I think that's one step beyond and will not lead to trust. But what we do, we will link it to protocols and desired actions by the department. So we do an order suggestion and that way you can ignore it. You're still in charge. But at least it is really easy to just make that action that, that seems most logical. Yeah, no, those are great. I think uh, Anurag in the, in the chat commented that, you know, some of the technology barriers are, are decreasing for adoption. Uh, so I think it, now they're moving more to the human part of that. And, and Sandeep, what, what are your thoughts on uh, the trust issues and also uh, the interface issues for human adoption or clinician adoption? Uh, look, Kirsch um, and Bart, both of you raised uh, really uh, two aspects which are really critical and from a translation perspective, uh, sorry, three issues actually uh, that you raised. One is change management processes, one is trust, and the other one is core design. So I just want to add one more aspect to implementation, that's education. Uh, so that comes about in terms of involving clinicians in the very beginning, not at the last part, like as the test uh, um, in the test phase, getting them to be involved in the design of the application, the interface, and possibly even being part of the governance panel and if you want to go a little bit ahead and you have the resources also involving patients as part of that uh, for design aspect is really important. Um, I'm wearing my educator hat and I think education is so critical because there's a lot of misconception about what AI can do or what it cannot do. So getting people on board is so critical and that doesn't have to be done by the vendors. It, there are other people who can do that. So I think right now there is an imperative on healthcare organizations, healthcare training institutions, and the government and policymakers to be able to offer that education around AI. And AI is developing so rapidly, it's hard to keep up with the developments, but I still think there is a um, 
a pathway and an option for to be, to be able to educate healthcare professionals. Right now, uh, Piyush, I'm kind of um, sidetracking and uh, going transgressing, um, going into a different direction, but I think it's really critical to be able to mention that here. Right now, medical education across the world, apart from a few institutions, do not teach uh, medical graduate, uh, medical students about AI, medical informatics. And from, to me, that is a shame because these uh, medical graduates, when they uh, graduate and then go into clinical practice, they will be surrounded by uh, advanced applications, possibly incorporating AI, and really they had to learn on the job, and that's not how uh, medical education should work. So possibly also incorporating AI into the medical education helps a lot. That way you will have uh, prepared clinicians, but also enable their option of AI. Well, very well said. And I think the two cap two things that I captured from that was one, I think it's the expectation that I put in the chat earlier too. I think we are so excited. We want it here and we want now. Like if it were, if I were to tell you like, well, there is a drug in development, you would be patient about it for, okay, yeah, it's in development, you know, it's gonna come one day and it might help. But yeah, we are also excited about AI and we want it here and we want it now and we want to use it. We want to touch it. We want to feel it. We want. Uh, we, we are excited, and that's where probably it's the expectation part too that I want it now, uh, which is which is phenomenal. But the other thing that uh, that brings us to the end of uh, of this uh, exciting event is uh, also about the uh, opportunity over here for for education, and that's been the uh, the part of uh, BrainX community's uh, mission. Uh, that we want to educate uh, everybody uh, in uh, for AI and healthcare. I'm trying to share my last screen over here. Just giving me some trouble. So just bear with me for one minute. Okay, there you go. Uh, and uh, we have a whole host of resources that have been made available exactly aligned with what you said, Sunday, to educate everybody, decrease that barrier uh, for understanding AI and healthcare whether you join our, our uh, webinar series, whether you read through some of the papers that are listed over there, whether you listen to somebody's inspiring podcast and learn from that, uh, we want to educate everybody, have a common platform for everybody. And uh, with that, bring this one to an end. Thank you everyone for joining us. Very exciting event. Thank you, Bart. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. And thank you all the participants for an awesome, uh, awesome event. Hope you all uh, learned a lot from this. Uh, it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe to that so that you can uh, get to that too. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.